This is CBC Here and Now. Deadly. I want to listen to their concerns. They need an every, everyday average person. Hey. Hi, I'm Jerry Rogers. Hi. I'm the leader of the NDP, and this is Kathleen Burt. Housing is an issue, especially for um, for people who aren't making a whole lot of money. So I'm sure. hoping you'll uh, get out and support me. You have a lot of chat about the 1.6 uh, busing kilometer, you know, uh, limitation on busing for schools. The voting begins in Topsail Paradise. And tonight we look at the three candidates hoping to win a seat in what will likely be the last by-election before this year's general election. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Voters in Topsail Paradise have their first chance to vote for their new MHA. Advanced polls open today and they're also open on Saturday and the regular polls are open during the by-election itself next Thursday. The three candidates are all vying for a spot in the House of Assembly just months before they'll likely be campaigning again during the 2019 general election. All three are new to the legislature. And all have different ideas on how they would do the job. Here and now is Malone Mullen caught up with these MHA hopefuls. PC headquarters is bustling. Volunteers hardly glance up from their clipboards with a week to go until the vote. This crowd is trying to secure a promotion for Paul Din, a Paradise Town Councillor who says he already knows just about every door he's knocking on. If you're going in public service, assess them. And, uh, you know, that don't mean text messages. That don't mean giving a call back, you know. That means making their effort to go out and listen to them. Din says he's close to issues facing the district. A limit on school bus pickups has ruffled some feathers. Same with water and sewage hookups. And, of course, taxes. But Din is confident he'll spend wisely. Much of what we do here when I'm on council here in Paradise is looking at uh, what our revenue we need to operate and provide the services and trying to come up with a happy medium. Those intimate ties to voters might be tough for his opponents to match, but the Liberal candidate says her track record as president of Mad Canada shows she's driven by passion and it gets results despite lacking any experience in politics. My honesty, my integrity, my hard work, my morals, my values, that's going to be brought forward and that means that I will listen to you and I will stand up. And yes, people are questioning, do you have the knowledge and the background? I believe I do. Coates might be a rookie, but she says a steep learning curve won't stand in the way of connecting with constituents. As long as I listen, as long as I pay attention, as long as I learn, I think I'll be very successful. I'm an everyday person. What people go through living paycheck to paycheck, having to do, have to have two jobs to survive, that's what my family and I have gone through. I grew up here on this street. My children grew up, sorry, on this street. So we know what's facing the areas. We know what's happening. And I'm a true believer in change. And if you're strong-minded, you listen, and you actually care about people, then I think you can make a big difference. While Heinz Coates has the full force of the ruling party behind her, the NDP candidate hopes to nab a third seat for her party, momentum ahead of the fall election. The college instructor is pitching a focus on broader, long-term issues, good jobs, good education, things that will keep young people from leaving the province in droves. It's sad, sad to see that because there's a lot of talent, a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation there, and just gone away. While the district has voted Tory for years, Burt says decades of bad decisions by the province's two big parties have opened up a third way. Let's face it, uh, we've had the Liberal government, we've had the Conservative government. They haven't made the best decisions for the people living in this province. So I think that I can offer people another choice. The canvassing continues and advanced voting opens tonight with the coveted empty seat up for the taking. Malone Mullen, CBC News, Paradise. One of the province's most well-known veterans has passed away. Leo Knox died Monday in St. John's at the age of 94. He served with the famed 166th Royal Artillery during the Second World War. He was also a prominent member of the St. John's Fire Department and the Singing Legionnaires. Here now, Zach Gowdy has more. Leo Knox did many remarkable things in his 94 years, from the trenches of World War II to protecting the city of St. John's as a fire captain.
But today, his family are remembering him most as a dedicated husband and father. He created in us, in our family, this magnificent circle of love. And it ripples down through, through us, through our children, to our children's children. Knox's youngest son, Rod, was with him on Monday when he passed. And he passed really peacefully and, and, and with no effort at all, you know, the way a, a good soldier would. Uh, there was no, there was no crying, there was, there was, it was just he knew that his time had come and that he had succeeded in everything he wanted to do. Do you recognize any of the boys in the field artillery? Like many of his generation, Knox lied about his age to enlist in the army. And like many veterans, he kept the memories of the war years largely to himself. I could tell that that was something very deep in him that he really struggled with. But that, I don't think Dad wanted to dwell on that. He's a, he's a guy who loves life tremendously, and he wanted to move forward from that and create a, a loving, caring, nurturing life for his family. After the war, Knox would again serve his community as a member of the St. John's Regional Fire Department. He became a fire prevention officer and was so dedicated to the job that when he was traveling the province on vacation, he would often visit public buildings to inspect them for safety. Longtime Legionnaire Gary Brown worked closely with Knox when Brown was a member of the RNC. What I always uh, thought, respected Leo so much for was when I'd see him all the time at the memorial on July 1st, November 11th, regardless of the weather, Leo Knox was there. And I would have, have to watch Leo and you'd see the tears rolling down his eyes because he was remembering his comrades and the people that never came back home and what he saw. Today I carry in my pocket a medal of uh, Billy Br Roost. Now with so few members of his generation left, Brown says Knox's passing is a true loss. Just a, a, a role model in our community. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saddened. Uh, he had a wonderful life and he was almost 94. But when, when we lose people like that, they we're losing part of our community fabric. Through his life of service, Knox became a hero to many, but he was always a hero to his family. In our eyes, I'm sure he's always been that way. You know, probably he was born that way. And I truly believe that people, there are people who are just destined for that type of life. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. A woman in Porterville is recovering from a run-in with her husband's rogue snowmobile. He was outside trying to get it started when he pulled the throttle, pushed the button, and the machine took off, speeding 100 meters toward their home. And then the skidoo crashed right through their house. Bruce Porter says all he could do was watch. He knew his wife was inside and the unmanned machine could do some serious damage. Came in through my dining room window, actually took the chandelier and hit the ceiling, tore the ceiling tiles down, uh, broke a uh, oak table and chair set, smashed that to pieces. And my wife was sitting on the Chesterfield and it hit her. We, of course, came down and we heard her screaming, and, and we really didn't know what to expect. You, you had to climb over things in order to get to where she was, and the machine was stopped. The, the track was on her legs. And my buddy Eli lifted the machine up, and I pulled her out from there. People say that if, if God was going to give me a miracle, he would turn the machine away, but sometimes he's got this special ways of getting our attention. But uh, we're very fortunate that the injuries, he, we thought she might have had broken bones, but she didn't. But it's a traumatic experience for her, let me tell you. Smashed up some parts of the snow machine, but there's millions of them things around. There's lots of windows around, but I've only got one wife and I only need one wife. <laughs> Well, all this talk of a runaway snowmobile might bring back some memories from the winter of 2015, back when a runaway rig was spotted traveling down the Trans-Canada Highway. It was on her own. 12 kilometers of terror, really. We can laugh and smile about it now because nobody was injured. It was a sight that had people across the country talking. A snowmobile with no driver loose on the TCH between Cornerbrook and Deer Lake. And it all started when the throttle malfunctioned 
and tossed the driver right off the machine. But then the speeding rig landed right side up on the highway and took off, heading straight for oncoming traffic. People tried to stop it. One person even pulled up alongside, hoping to reach the kill switch. But ultimately, it was a snowbank that stopped the machine, as you recall, 12 long kilometers later. That was quite the story. It was. Is it ever? Wow, I can't imagine that definitely happening. Uh, well, as far as weather goes, we've got an Arctic air mass spreading across the province. It's bringing some pretty chilly temperatures right across the board. And with that, it's the perfect setup for snow squalls. So we're looking at snow squalls on the west part of the island. And then heading towards Monday, it's looking more and more likely that we're going to see that January thaw. Uh, quite a significant warm up in place. Could see temperatures in the teens quickly uh, in some cases and then significant rainfall. So we'll have all those details and your full forecast when I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, why do men kill women and what can men do about it? It's a question some people in this province are asking after recent news headlines. Last week, the former boyfriend of Chantel John was charged with first degree murder in her death. And then a few days later, a Bay St. George man was charged with attempted murder in an incident involving his alleged estranged partner. Here now is Meg Roberts explains. It's not just the recent headlines that show the alarming reality of intimate partner violence in this province. A woman's shelter in St. John's is also seeing an increase in the amount of women coming through their doors, fleeing violence. This is the time of year when Christmas bills start coming in. People often feel um, less energetic, more, more mental health concerns in the winter. You look at the weather we're having out today, people aren't going out for a walk and doing things that to do, to do good self-care. Executive Director of the Iris Kirby House says numbers are up for complex reasons. Drug activity and mental health issues are on the rise. And she says the Me Too movement has also influenced more women to leave their abusive partners. How can we change it? I think we have to start looking at each other as equals and looking at the relationships and the power balance in relationships. It's not necessarily about people wanting to hurt each other. It's about not having tools. It's about learn, learning to have a more of a balanced approach, uh, respect, respecting everyone as individuals. That concept is the focal point of a local men's group upcoming discussion. The First Light Center is hosting a conversation called Why Do Men Kill Women and What Can Men Do About It? The discussion was prompted by the recent homicide of Indigenous woman Chantel John. I think getting men together to talk about an issue which traditionally has been perceived as a women's issue, such as violence against women, which somehow is a women's issue despite it being perpetrated by men almost exclusively. So I think getting men to recognize that this is a men's issue, that men bear the responsibility to fix this. Men are the ones who can stop murdering women. Harvey thinks change will happen with small steps like this. If one man is willing to listen and learn, more will follow. Meg Roberts, CBC News. St. John's. Fire crews had to clean up a diesel fuel spill at a gas station in Donovan's Industrial Park in Mount Pearl last night. What is likely a commercial truck pulled away from a fuel pump at the Irving after filling up with diesel. Partially filling up anyhow, but the driver forgot to put the nozzle back in place. St. John's Fire Department says about 800 liters of fuel came from the pump, but some of that would have been pumped into the vehicle, so they can't say for sure just how much spilled on the ground. Firefighters poured bags of absorbent material over the spill area and a small berm was built around the storm drain to keep the fuel from running into it. Canadian officials are condemning the killing of a Halifax mining executive in Burkina Faso. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland says the crime shouldn't go unpunished. This is a terrible, uh, the terrible crime and Canada is absolutely committed to working with the authorities in Burkina Faso to bring those responsible to justice. Kirk Woodman was abducted on Tuesday night. He was working at a mining site owned by Canada's Progress Minerals near the border with Niger. His body was found yesterday and identified by colleagues. Burkina Faso recently declared a state of emergency in the area after repeated attacks by extremists. Woodman's family says not a day will go by that he won't be missed. Well, Prince Philip was in a car crash today, but Buckingham Palace says the 97-year-old Duke of Edinburgh wasn't injured. 
A palace spokesperson says the accident involved another vehicle and it took place close to the Sandringham estate. The Duke was driving a Range Rover and was pulling out of a driveway when the accident happened. Witnesses say the car flipped and the prince was conscious but also shocked and shaken. The Queen and Prince Philip have been staying at Sandringham since Christmas. The Ennis sisters are teaming up with the Alzheimer's Society of Newfoundland and Labrador to spread a message that's close to their hearts. Uh, and that message has to do with the fact that every hour, nine Canadians are diagnosed with dementia. And they're not the ones, or the only ones rather, who are affected by that. The Singing Sisters debuted their new music video today, written in dedication to their father, who died last March after living with the illness for three years. The song launched alongside an e-learning program called the Dementia Passport. And that program is focused on enhancing quality care to people with dementia. Listening signs about three years leading up to his diagnosis, and we all ignored it. We we were pretending that it wasn't happening, we were in complete denial. Um, and then Dad had an episode one, one day. Um, he, he woke up from a nap and he didn't recognize our mother. Um, and that was somebody he was married to for 40 years. So we had no choice at that point but to face this and, um, and to deal with it. Now stay tuned because later in the show we'll have more from our chat with the Ennis sisters. And you'll also see some snippets from their new video, California Wine. Some of the worst flood damage on the west coast happened in Humber Arm South. Well up to the eve of the garage and the house, so uh, approximately 10 feet of water. I'll take you there to show you how things are going now, a year later.
Welcome back. So a lot of people were walking by the CBC this afternoon and they were sort of more bundled up than they were mm. this morning. The day got really cold. It sure did. Yeah. Just as fast as those temperatures climbed this morning. Take a look at them. Uh, these were the highs and believe it or not, it was in the morning hour. So right. one degree in St. John's and then uh, generally sitting between zero and minus three. Now up through Labrador, those temperatures are sitting around in the minus teens. Now take a look at the temperatures. If you haven't been outside yet, you're in for a rude awakening, especially up through Labrador, minus 31 for Lab City right now. And then those temperatures along the West Coast dipping down to the minus, uh, about minus 10 in Corner Brook and then sitting at minus four right now in St. John's. Now factor in that wind chill, it's feeling much colder. So in the minus 20s along the West Coast up through Labrador, Wind chill values have been sitting around minus 40, minus 44 this afternoon for uh, Labrador City and then Happy Valley Goose Bay right now sitting at minus 35 or minus 36 rather heading through the night tonight, especially through tomorrow morning. Take a look at these numbers. So in the minus 20s, minus 26 should be your wind chill value for Badger and then up through Labrador at minus 46. We're looking at for Lab City likely seeing temperatures down around minus 40 or feeling more like minus 46 because it's not actually a temperature. Uh, but we do have a number of warnings. Uh, the extreme cold warnings essentially for all of Labrador and down through Northern Peninsula East as well. Those wind chill values between minus 35 and minus 50. And with these numbers, uh, wind chill values in the minus 28 to minus 39 value, uh, frostbite can occur between 10 to 30 minutes. We start to get way less than that, five to 10 minutes for those wind chill values of what we're gonna experience tonight up through Labrador. So if you're heading out, Definitely make sure you are bundled up because any exposed skin can freeze within five to 10 minutes, which is certainly dangerous. When you start to get higher, uh, that can happen in less than two to five minutes. So definitely dangerous if you are not properly bundled. So because of that Arctic air mass that's in place, it's a perfect setup for onshore uh, squalls. You can already see that developing along the West Coast and that will continue tonight. So Environment Canada does have that snow squall watch in effect. We're already seeing the snow squall. So uh, looking at about five to 10 centimeters possible in these squalls through the overnight tonight. Uh, in through Deer Lake as well. And you can see that on the future tracker picking it up actually quite nicely by tomorrow morning. Uh, things will generally clear out. We're under a big ridge of high pressure, which is why we're seeing those colder temperatures. Uh, so things will stay generally clear for the most part. We'll see uh, that potential for a few flurries down through Marystown as well, or rather the Buren Peninsula. And then uh, some increasing cloud through the afternoon tomorrow. And then again, that risk of some onshore flurries. The winds will shift, so it won't be quite as strong as we're seeing today. And then uh, some more flurry activity expected through the north and south, or rather west and central Labrador. So here's a look at your forecast for tonight. Temperatures dipping down into the minus teens tonight. Minus eight for Port of Basque, looking at that chance of flurries. And then clearing, and then up through Labrador, uh, minus 30s and those wind chill values quite cold. And then tomorrow, uh, we're gonna see those temperatures down again. So back down to the minus uh, single digits. This is well below seasonal for this time of year, between five and uh, 10 degrees below seasonal. St. Anthony, minus 17 as your afternoon high tomorrow, tomorrow. So it looks like a mix of sun and cloud. We will see that increasing cloud with that potential for flurries, lingering flurries though, along the west coast and then up through Labrador. Not a bad day, just that chance of flurries moving along as well. Shouldn't see much in the way of accumulation though, uh, just uh, the chance there. Nain, minus 24 tomorrow afternoon with a uh, mix of sun and cloud. Now looking ahead, these temperatures, Arctic temperatures are gonna stick around for Labrador, but we're in for a warm up for most of Newfoundland. I'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, this week we're looking back one year to when a major storm hit the West Coast. The Bay of Islands area was the worst hit by floods, landslides and structural damage. The floods destroyed areas of Humber Arms South and the town is still trying to rebuild. Here now is Colleen Connors reports. Well, this is what the mayor had to deal with a year ago. Landslides, cracked roads, floods and washouts. They got home at 11 o'clock that night, 11, 12 o'clock. Got my waders off from the day and uh, by around 1.30 I was called out again that, that same morning. So it was, it was a full weekend of it. It was just crazy, right? Savard says town staff and emergency crews would drive down the road and see about 100 flooded homes. Here, a landslide in the backyard filled the family garage with dirt and debris. Like going to, to one place and you see people out and everyone waving and that was, it was just amazing like this. 
you didn't know if there was damage there or not. You didn't know why they were waving to you, and it was just it was so much to sink in. Culverts surrounding Clark's Brook couldn't handle all the rainfall and melted snow. Water cascaded over the roads, the school parking lot, and filled Daryl Jesso's parents' home. At first glance, this house looks quite normal. But a year ago, there was water up to the top of these windows at this house in Ben West Cove. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, well up to the eaves of the garage and the house, so uh, approximately 10 feet of water. The house was submerged. Uh, inside is nothing but a disaster, really, is mole and is done, right? Were your parents able to salvage anything? Uh, just a few things up high there, a uh, few uh, videotapes and stuff they had years ago and stuff, a few memories and whatever, and tried with some pictures and stuff, but that's about it. It took the Gesso family about a year to receive disaster relief funding. The house will be torn down this spring, and the land is not fit to build on. With the help of some disaster relief money, the town fixed up the brook next door, but more needs to be done. We dug through the brook, we put stuff up on the sides. It's going to founder in again, it's just a matter of time. We asked for uh, armor stone and stuff for there, but we were denied that. We had it dredged out and everything, but uh, starting to fill back in again now, so uh, I think it was only just a, a temporary fix. The town wished the disaster relief funding would cover more than just a temporary fix. The hope now is the brook doesn't overflow with another heavy rainfall. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Humber Arm South. It's been going on far An ad long. campaign that's earning respect and bringing out the haters. We speak with a marketing expert about the risks behind Gillette's latest campaign.
Well, Gillette's new ad is closing in on 17 million views on YouTube. It's trending second on the site. And as we told you earlier this week, this ad takes on toxic masculinity, and it's got a lot of people talking. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. The ad changes Gillette's slogan to a question asking, is this really the best a man can get? It references the Me Too movement, bullying and sexual harassment. It says men can no longer laugh it all off because they need to set an example for the next generation. Now joining us now in studio is Munn business professor Tom Cooper. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Now this ad, it's really taken off. I wonder, what's, what's your initial reaction to it? My initial reaction is great play, great way to sell razors. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, we're here, we're talking about the ad. We're here on television here in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador. When you have an ad that that's influential, that we, we, we start talking about it, that's good marketing. Mm -hmm. And the ad references the Me Too movement, and it seems like more and more brands are you know, doing more. They're trying to send a message beyond just selling a product like Nike and Colin Kaepernick and sure. Dove and uh, sending a positive body image message. Uh, why do you think that is? I, it's, it's a good way of selling, selling product. Um, if you look at who actually buys the razors, and in a number of ways they're appealing to the female market because a lot of the first time uh, buyers of razors for uh, their sons and their, their husbands is gonna be uh, wives and mothers, number one. Uh, number two, the size of the female grooming uh, industry is huge. So we're looking at probably double the size of the men's grooming business. And then thirdly, in terms of, you know, at, getting those initial uh, people who when they start off saying, I'm gonna go choose a razor, because once you choose it, you're probably sticking f with it for a long, long time. This may uh, influence millennials, may influence uh, the generation before that, or the generation coming up in terms of deciding, this is what I really wanna uh, associate myself with. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of the size of the industry and what the risk level is for an ad campaign like this, because there sure. is, for lack of a better term, there's a lot of razor burn out there. Totally, with yeah. Men going online saying, "I'm never, I'm going to shick. I'm not buying Gillette. Forget it. I'm tired of being crapped on because I'm a man." Yeah. What's the risk here? It's a pretty big risk, Anthony. You got a 49.5 billion dollar industry in terms of men grooming. Uh, Gillette alone had a two billion dollar. Uh, in 2015, size of the market share. They sell in over 200 uh, countries. Um, pretty much everybody at some point has used Gillette. Uh, but you have a hyper-competitive market. You also have a market with people like me who have beards uh, who aren't using razors as often. So they, with a hyper-competitive market in terms of how do they differentiate themselves and how do they make themselves different than, say, uh, Bic or Laser or Energizer or all some of the brands, and especially a lot of the Chinese brands mm -hmm. that we've not heard before, this is, once again, maybe uh, positioning themselves into, uh, into a specific part of the market. Right. And this really made a lot of people mad. You saw you know, oh, yeah. online people burning their razors, yes, chucking yeah. them in the garbage, stuff like yep. that. Why do you think the outrage it's, it's part of, um, I think it's part of a wider outreach, Carolyn. When you look at, um, I think Wired Magazine summed it up really well. When you look at the people who vote for Trump and when you look at that kind of those segments, they're saying, you know, th there's fundamental change going on within society. There's a fundamental change in terms of how we view a lot of different things. And those people are upset. And anytime we look at change, you're going to look at change in, a, in, in a, maybe in a negative way, not in a positive way. So I think, once again, they may be just saying, okay, we're okay not people not buying that, that core, not buying our product, but what we're interested in is the wider, who's gonna be accepting of the change, who are gonna look back in 10 years and gonna say, geez, you know, was it like that back then? That's, that's a lot different. Mm -hmm. Interesting, maybe just to wrap things up, in the Nike case, people are burning their shoes the same way as Carolyn, yeah. they're burning their razors, flushing them down the toilets online, and these kind of things. But, you know, somebody didn't just wake up one day and say, hey guys, I got a great idea for an ad campaign. No. There were yep. board meetings, there were focus groups, I mean, what do they know that we don't? I mean, they're, not, they're obviously not going to take a kind of risk with this, uh, like this without thinking that there's a lot to be made here. Yeah, you, you have to think this is a multi-million dollar decision, multi-tens of million dollar decision. They, like you mentioned, they're doing focus groups, they're doing interviews, they know who their customers are and they know who their core product is as well. They're not gonna touch this or go into this kind of ad unless they see this as a really good potential. And the, once again, and from a strategic standpoint, where they want to position not only the Gillette brand, but the wider Procter & Gamble 
brand, which because Procter and Gamble owns Gillette. So this is a kind of you know water strategic decision right. for. The I noticed company. looking at your face that you've already decided to boycott the product. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, and I've boycotted for at least the last four years because my wife likes it. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much for you. having me. From back in 69 When we had no doubt that I was yours and you were mine The Ennis sisters are getting personal. Opening up about their father's battle with dementia with a new song, music video and new message. Welcome back to Here and Now. So how do you think you'd respond to a boss if you were given 30 seconds to explain why you should be the person to get the job? Well, we put the candidates in next week's by-election in Topsail Paradise under that kind of pressure. So here's their pitch to their potential employers, you, the voters. I think that uh, a vote for the NDP is a vote for doing politics differently. It's time for more collaboration, less um, top-heavy, uh, trickle-down kind of politics. It's time to get some democracy back here because we have lots and lots of intelligent, innovative people. How are you doing today? This is my job interview. I'm interviewing for a job to work for you for the next uh, number of months and then hopefully uh, four years after. So what I'm bringing to the job here is past experience, in municipal politics, I'm bringing 30 plus years of experience with uh, provincial and federal government, working with FPT, federal, provincial and territorial groups. If you want a person who is honest, who has integrity, morals, values, someone who is just like you, who lives paycheck to paycheck, who works hard, who believes in Newfoundland and Labrador, then I am your candidate. Please elect me to be your strong voice. I promise to listen and I promise to be committed to the constituents of the Topsail Paradise area. Well, it's something many families across this province can relate to, caring for a loved one with dementia. Now, earlier in the show, we told you about a new song by the Ennis sisters. It was written in dedication to their dad. 
He died last March after living with the illness for three years. Our Bruce Tilly spoke with the Ennis sisters today about the toll dementia can take on a family. Well, we were noticing signs about three years leading up to his diagnosis, and we all ignored it. We, we were pretending that it wasn't happening. We were in complete denial. Um, and then Dad had an episode one, one day. Um, he, he woke up from a nap, and he didn't recognize our mother. Um, and that was somebody he was married to for 40 years. So we had no choice at that point but to face this and, um, and to deal with it. So as you can imagine, it was quite devastating. After a number of doctor's appointments, uh, he was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. And that journey for us was, um, was very interesting. Um, watching our dad, who was our Superman, he was our hero. He just knew how to do everything. He was so smart. Uh, family came first. Um, just watching his memories fade and, and he, his personality changed and um, to have to come together and support him through that, uh, it, was, it was very challenging. And our father, because of the stigma that is associated with that disease, he made us promise not to tell anybody. But we realized that when somebody is diagnosed with dementia, it's not just that person that's going through this, it it's affects the entire family and we realized we needed the support as well. Mom was the primary caregiver, and uh, we all sort of had our roles inside the, the family. Uh, I know Teresa took care of a lot of doctor's appointments, and Karen was there to make sure of uh, physical activity kind of things on a daily basis, uh, making sure, and for me, it was a music. I'd go in and play uh, um, the piano while Dad played the accordion, and we felt like there was a calm, and people, Mom could have a break. We each did our bit to make sure Mom had at least at least an hour to herself every day um, because Dag was, in our case, able to stay with us until the final three weeks of his life. Um, so we just pulled together as a family and did the best we could. And there were very difficult situations because Dad became agitated quite easily. And we had to learn how to sort of roll with, um, if, he, if we were other people in his story, we had to be those people. We had to not uh, challenge him on his truth in that moment and we had to learn how to be uh, and keep things very calm. I think he would be very proud of this and uh, you know it's very emotional I still can't watch the video without tearing up uh, and even <laughs> speaking about it you know just brings about so many wonderful memories of dad because he just really supported our musical career he was a button accordion player and really inspired us to be musical and I believe that he's the reason why we chose this path uh, so I think that if, if he were able to look in on this that uh, he would be very proud of his daughters no doubt. It's sad, but uh, beautiful dedication. Yeah, beautiful yeah. video, too. And you can watch the full music video for California Wine online. It's being shared on the Alzheimer's Society of Newfoundland and Labrador's Facebook page. You can check it out there. Well, everything is starting to freeze yet again tonight. Uh, through the weekend, we're in for a little bit of a roller coaster, so expect much more of the same. I'll have all the details in your forecast. Yeah, I'll go spread some salt during the break. Uh, it looks like it needs it out there. I agree.
This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back, everyone. So, Ashley, you were saying that we're in for a bit of a continued roller coaster ride when it comes to temperatures. Absolutely. Up and down right through the weekend. Uh, we'll take a look at the forecast for Saturday because there's a little bit of uh, discrepancy or I shouldn't say that, but what's going to happen is a little bit debatable at this point. We're going to see that potential for some flurries across most of uh, Newfoundland and then up through Labrador as well. We'll see that chance of flurries. Now, this rain snow line, depending on where that sets up, I think it's going to be uh, closer towards central into the afternoon so we could see things change over from snow or flurries in the morning and then eventually over to showers into the afternoon as those temperatures climb up above zero. That moves off and then we get back into that colder pattern, as I mentioned, that up and down as we head through the weekend. Into Sunday, it looks like things actually clear out quite nicely with a big ridge of high pressure, at least through the first half of the day. So here's a look at your Saturday forecast. As I mentioned, those temperatures I have between one and two degrees for parts of central, at least through uh, Grand Falls, Windsor. So that's why I'm thinking things will change back over uh, to showers into the afternoon. Otherwise, along the coast, we'll stay into that uh, below zero temperatures, minus two for Corner Brook, zero degrees in Port of Basque. And then up through Labrador, hanging on to those cold temperatures, Lab City only reaching a high near minus 30 uh, through the day on Saturday and then generally sitting in the minus 20s for the rest of Labrador, except along the coast where those temperatures will reach the minus single digits. So looking ahead into Saturday or rather Sunday, things will stay nice through the first half of the day. Then we start to see the next weather maker move in and this one is going to be quite significant with quite a bit of snow to start that pushes up toward, uh, towards Labrador. And then we've got that potential for some freezing rain and then in behind it we get into that southerly flow again. And then that's where we're going to see those temperatures climbing potentially to the teens in some cases and then significant rainfall amounts with this system as well. Right now we're showing between 20 to 40 millimeters of rain for most of Newfoundland. So uh, that will push out into Tuesday afternoon and then in behind that again, we're going to get back into that colder temperatures and we're looking at that risk of uh, snow moving in yet again into the evening of Tuesday. Looking ahead, we are in for an active pattern. So it's going to be one after another uh, heading through the next couple of days. So or at least through the next couple of weeks rather. Let's look at your five day forecast, three degrees on Saturday into Sunday. We dip back down and then that rain and snow on Monday. Same thing for central Newfoundland. Uh, have a temperature near eight degrees. That potential could go up even higher. And then same thing for western Newfoundland with those uh, temperatures dipping to the minus 10 and then up to about seven degrees on Monday. Through eastern uh, Labrador, those temperatures generally sitting in the minus 20s right through the rest of the week. And then uh, for Western Labrador, those temperatures are going to be sitting in the minus 30s. Overnight values could reach the minus 40 degree mark. We'll definitely have to keep an eye on that one. So let's look at your forecast, look at your weather photo when I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. More than half the food produced in Canada is wasted. That's the astonishing result of a first ever survey of food waste right across the country. And it calls for change in the way Canadians view food. CBC's Ron Charles explains. While Canadians have a sense that a lot of food gets wasted, no one has ever before added up all the waste through the entire supply chain. From farms and fishing boats, through processing plants, to distributors, to grocers, and to our homes. A study released today suggests the sum of all that waste is astronomical. 58% of what's grown, raised, or fished in Canada is wasted. Each year, 11.2 million metric tons is unnecessarily wasted. That's enough food to fill a freight train that stretches from Ottawa to past Winnipeg. Or enough food for every Canadian, rich or poor, to eat for five months. The total financial value of this food is $49 billion. The study for the Toronto Food Rescue Organization's Second Harvest is funded by Walmart's charitable foundation and was conducted by a consulting firm that tries to reduce waste in food processing. There is a culture of accepting waste. There is actually, I would actually go to the point, there is a culture in some elements of industry, government and academia of actually thinking that food loss and waste is beneficial because it drives the economy. 
He says aside from needing to change attitudes about waste, the food industry also needs to stop practices, such as putting best before dates on food that isn't harmful when spoiled. It's that there are businesses who apply purposely conservative best before dates in the knowledge that it's going to drive purchases. That they actually abuse it. He would like to see rules about best before dates tightened and standardized. As well, the study suggests looking at more ways to cut down on waste at all stages of production and to donate food that would otherwise be wasted. Second Harvest and the study authors have a meeting next week to share their findings with federal government officials. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Ron Charles mentioned best before dates. This next story sets a record. Ancient diets are on the minds of Canadian researchers in southern Ontario because they've found a cache of 140,000 quinoa seeds near Brantford, Ontario. The discovery is the first of its kind. Quinoa grows in Kentucky and Tennessee in the U.S., but not in Ontario. So researchers say the find suggests that Indigenous communities had trade relationships spanning the continent. Well, seven-year-old girl in Nova Scotia is being called a hero after she helped rescue her family from a near-fatal car crash. Her mother's minivan went off the road, slipped and then flipped over and landed in a river. Three children under eight were inside, and as you'll see, this child does not lack confidence. David Burke has that story. If you see anyone else who has a car accident, just make sure you have a seven-year-old or six-year-old to help. Sophia LeBlanc has some good advice for motorists. She would know since she was instrumental in saving her own family from a car crash in November. Her mother Candace Hicks was on her way to Oxford when her van hit a rut and she lost control of the vehicle. Um, we hit the guardrail, made a really loud noise. I think we still all have that noise in our head. And um, we flew off into the river. I didn't know how deep it was, so it was, I just knew we were going into water. Um, yeah, it was really scary. The van flew over an embankment, flipped, and landed on its roof in a river. Hicks and Sophia managed to crawl out a window, but the other two children were still trapped inside, and one was unconscious. Candace couldn't get her two-year-old unstrapped because her arm was broken, so she got Sophia to do it. I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to leave her standing there in the water and my son unconscious down by the river. So I asked Sophia to, to climb up and wave down a car. The hill was so steep, Sophia had to climb onto her mother's back to get a grip and start climbing out. But I knew I could do, I could do something safely and save my family. So that's why I felt a little like, because I thought I was a little scared. My heart, I think, was being really fast. She managed to flag down help. At the same time, a man living nearby saw what happened and called 911. I didn't figure anybody was going to make it out or too many people weren't going to make it out, but they got lucky. You know, they were really lucky. Terry managed to cut Sophia's brother free from the van. Besides some cuts and bruises, the children are all fine. The RCMP were so impressed by Sophia's bravery, they presented her with an act of heroism award. Although Sophia was a bit disappointed when she learned her award might just be a piece of paper. I thought, because I was so brave, I thought I would get something a little better. But Sophia didn't need to worry. The RCMP and EHS had her covered. Along with the award, she and her siblings also received some new toys. <laughs> David Burke, CBC News, Amherst. Horrible. The kid's right. <laughs> you save four people. Totally right? did. Flowers, toys, a whole bit. Yeah. So all we need now, behind in my car anyhow, so with the flares and the booster cables. And a seven-year-old. Seven -old, right? So if you have one, <laughs> Make sure you bring her tweet. along. <laughs> well, here's your weather photo of the day. Another gorgeous sunset. Loving the colors this time of year. Any idea where that is? Absolutely gorgeous, though. Great place to go snowmobiling. That's not that solo <laughs> ski do doing those uh, tracks, I, I hope. <laughs> it very well might be. Someone's having a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you where this photo is taken and who took it when we come back.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, the lunar calendar's Year of the Pig begins next month. Mm -hmm. And that means an unusual museum in South Korea is expecting business to really pick up. Now, this pig museum is not far from the capital, Seoul. It features multiple performances by some very clever and agile piggies. Oh. <laughs> There's artwork from dozens of countries and many opportunities to get up close and pretty personal with sometimes affectionate pigs. Oh, they're so cute. Mm -hmm. Those pigs, uh, by the way, are seen as symbols of wealth and luck and can bring good fortune. Yeah, good bacon too. Oh, I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, Some people have pigs for pets. That's true, but I yeah, lived I in Asia. I don't give pets. those pigs a great odds. <laughs> no. They're amazing. They're very smart, though. Yeah. Pigs are very intelligent creatures. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Smart as dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we, should we take a look at it? Well, there it is. Yep. There's your weather photo for the day today. Any so, uh, idea? Uh, no. Where's that now? Gander Bay. Gander Bay. I had to look up that one because I thought it was Gander, but then realized that it's two very different places. North well, of Gander there, yeah. So with all that weather you've delivered, uh, any pent-up people who love to ride snow machines, and there are lots in this province, you can almost tell by those tracks how much fun because on an open lake you can really rip mm -hmm. it open, right? Oh, yes. Definitely can. That's uh, at Third Pond. Mm -hmm. So Michelle beautiful. Eastman sent us that photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. I guess with all that rain coming, uh, you probably want to avoid taking any heavy machinery on top of uh, any kind of body of water <laughs> for yeah. the next... Uh, yeah, well, just you know, be safe. If yeah. you know it's cold, I think six inches of ice is mm -hmm. safe. So. Use your auger, drill a hole, make sure you're safe wherever you go and play. Are you much of a skidooer? Did you? I, I dabbled a little bit okay. up north. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a skidoo, but I, right. you know, would always, I was just riding on the All back right. of it normally. Note to management. <laughs> yep, get <Skidoo>. her out. <laughs> oh, I would love to do that. That would be so much fun. Definitely We'll, we'll so find much a way fun. to get you out on one. Now you watch now. Everyone's watching here now. We're going to send these offers. Okay. I've got a great <laughs> assignment for your meteorologist. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure to get a helmet. Oh, of course. Yeah. Safety first. That's right. Always. My dad always tells me that. <laughs> Good <laughs> it's advice. Been drilled in, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. That's about it. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And tomorrow's Friday. Is it already? Yes. Already Friday. The week went okay. quickly. See you tomorrow. Sure did. Good night. Good night. It's Friday already. Yes.